I didn't realize you were doing Jack Frost book. Uh, as I wanted to prepare for this, you know, sometimes I make a PowerPoint. The Lord just said, come up and tell them what's on you. Amen. What have you been going through? What's, right. what's your reality now in the spirit realm? Mm-hmm. So this isn't going to, I'm not going to tickle your mind here today. I hope I tickle your heart. Amen. You know, uh, you just mentioned I wrestled in high school and college a little bit. Uh, my senior year, the wrestling coach who was, he trained CIA agents. Uh, he was the Head Start principal of the Head Start school that my mother started. And that summer, my mother had caught him using the Head Start credit card buying stuff for his house. Wow. So she said, you're going to finish. We needed a, they needed a teacher for the funding. She said, you're going to finish the year as the, the principal, but you, your salary's done. You're going to pay back what you stole. And that's it. Well, that, that winter, uh, he had me thrown off the wrestling team right before the championship guys I beat are up on the podium now with their hand up you know so it was bitter bitter experience to sit up in the bleachers and watch guys in street clothes watch guys that you handled the guy that wrestled JV under me came in second in the districts and I mean that's how dominant our weight class was and uh, two months later I started dating Cheryl so you know God throws you a bone you know, even though we were going through stuff, he still he still helps you out a little bit. You're saying Cheryl's a bone? Oh, now, another thing, at these meetings, what, what copies of these meetings? They're in the Navy, loose lips, same shit. Nothing outside that door there. Okay? Well, I get out of, I, I get married, I get saved, I forgive the coach uh, to myself, I hadn't seen him. 25 years go by, I get a phone call. Guy I went to school with, he's uh, on a Hall of Fame committee or something. He said, uh, John, uh, would you would you uh, mind calling coach, the coach up? And I said, well, why? What do you want me to call the coach up for? He goes, well, I said, I've got, you know, I have nothing against him, but what's the reason? He said, well, he's got cancer. Wow. He's got about six months to live. We've tried to put him in the Hall of Fame three times and he's declined. And every time he says, I can't, because I went to, to John Christ. Mm, wow. He knew it was wrong. And he lived with it. It broke my heart that he lived with it all those years. Wow. Because I had forgiven him. In 1973, I, I said, I forgive you. Wow. To the Lord. It's, it's over. Wow. I started a new path. Amen. Amen. I got to talk with him. He, They wheeled him out on a wheelchair. A gurney, I wasn't there. And he was entered into the Hall of Fame right before he died. Amen. Wow. Wow. See, what I want is the things that seem so big to you are not that big. Right. Don't major in minors in your life. Nice. Get rid of them and move on. Yeah. So yeah. that's what you remind me of. I, you know, I know I don't look like a wrestler now, but I just had a metal knee put in. I had my shoulder rewired. Paul wrote about it. He said, the outward man perishes, but the inner man is stronger day by day. I'm grabbing a hold of that scripture. So, I, I want you just to realize we are in a new season. And I don't want to belabor things and go too long because I know you got to get back and see the Giants playoff. Oh, no. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> GI8 making the playoffs. Is that how you spell that? And I, I, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I didn't watch a whole lot of football this year. But my daughter in law is from McAllen, Texas. She's diehard Dallas, and my son's diehard Eagles. And it's an interesting dynamic. All their kids were born right after football season because I guess they were mad at each other all during <laughs> football season. But I watched a couple, I went over to the house, I see him on Sunday afternoons. And, uh, you know, I watched a couple, she always had the Cowboy game up. Well, they played like six teams that didn't have their quarterback. I'm thinking, well, who wants to watch third stringers play? And that's all year it's been that way. It's been a weird. Hasn't it been weird, though? Yeah. I wonder who's going to play this week. Who's going to be the quarterback? Yeah. Everything's been upside down. Everything. Except there's one thing that's for sure. The Father's love. When Jesus, when they came to Jesus and they said, teach us how to pray, Rabbi. What did he say? Our Father. Our Father. When, when John baptized Jesus and he came up out of the water, the, the heavens opened up. And what did the Father say? 
This is my son. See, the father-son relationship is pre premier in, in, in the heavenly realm. And that's why I believe most of us, most, I'm going to say most, have had issues. My dad left when I was two weeks old. I'm not going to really go into all that. It's, Rick Joyner wrote an article. I published an article about it. But, you know, the abuse to my mother stopped when I got big enough to stop it. Mm -hmm. My dad and I went through a wall. He was threatened, you know, for, for two years, I would never walk home on the blacktop because I knew he was looking for me. Wow. And he was a hunter. And he, he said, all you're going to see is a flash, wow. which is <laughs> coming out of the back end of the barrel, you know. So I, 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 could, I could probably bring some of you to, to tears telling you my story. I don't want to do that today. All I can tell you is I've moved past it. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. God. Whatever you got to do, you got to move past Amen. whatever it is that's in your roadblock there. Yeah. And so, as as we were down, I was down in Texas uh, a couple weeks ago, and Chuck commissioned, I don't know, a couple thousand people. But we were commissioned by Chuck Pierce 20 some years ago. And what he said to me was, You are going to release an expression of the Father's love into the earth realm, a new expression. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. So and I received it, and I, I would pray over it. I, I would remind myself of it. I raised my two sons and a daughter. You know, if you ask them about their father, my kids don't have traumas about their father. Amen. Because I had their back. Amen. You know, I, I, I told this story. I was like, getting beat up out in a, a plowed field by seven, 12-year-olds when I was five. And they were jumping on me, and I get, kept going into the dirt. I couldn't see. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't. I had, and dirt was everywhere. And I heard one of them say, five years old, we don't have to worry about this kid. You don't have an old man. Wow. And the spirit of bitterness entered me right then. In the midst of all that, that I hated my father. I hated that he didn't back me up. And see, as grievous as that sounds, see, fast forward now, I get married, I have a couple of kids. My son's seven or eight years old. And I come in the house and I hear this whimpering. It was summertime and I, I walked around and I didn't see anybody. And the one window was open at the end of the house. I went there and there was my son was out there and there was two older kids and they were taking turns jumping on me. And it just brought me right back wow. into that field. And I ran around that house, grabbed these two kids, had them right to my face. I said, "You touch that kid again, you're touching me." And I said, "Not get off my prop," and I threw him down. One of them's a Toyota car salesman. I bought like eight cars from him. The other one's a wrestling coach. And we, we've been best friends ever since. I mean, they, they, and one day they were playing football on a, a, a side lot. And this one kid from Philly, he had a cousin from Philly. And my son tackled him. He was a couple years older than him. And he, I guess the kid took an exception to it. And he pushed Jeremy down. And the one kid went, because my son was telling me he was laughing about it. One, Danny went like this. He went, no, 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 no. Don't touch that kid. <laughs> His father will hunt you down. Just don't, don't touch him. Okay? And he said, Dad, you always had our back. Amen. So, Amen. so you reverse the curse Amen. by doing. Yes. Wow. Everybody say that. Reverse the curse by doing. Reverse. You know what I found out? I'm 67 years old. Most people don't care what you know. They don't care what you say. They care what you do. What are you doing for the kingdom of God? What's your assignment? That's... Really, if I have a question for each of you today as men, what is your assignment from the Lord? You know, when, when uh, I was talking with Peter that last night, when Saul got knocked off his horse, there was Ananias, and the Lord said, go lay hands on, on, on Saul. And he kind of, God, did he have you like, kept up on this guy lately? I mean, he's in prison and killing people. And he goes, I got a lot for him to do. He had a mission already predestined right. in the heavenly realm. Right. Wow. My folks, what I want to say to you is you have a mission yes. here on earth, already right. predestined yep. in the heavenly realm. You just have to figure out how to tap into it. Amen. You got to figure out how to get a hold of it. Now, that may be a prophetic word. It may be a vision. It may be a dream. But it's most of the things that the church as a whole has discounted. If you're not hearing from God, you can go the wrong direction. Right. Yeah, that's right. Robert Heidler put up a train switch, you know, the, the, the Y switches, and they throw the lever and the train shifts tracks. Do you realize that the ride is very familiar, whether you're on this track or that track? The only difference is the destination. And you can get shifted to the wrong track. I could have stayed in that bitterness over that coach. Right. 
I could have stayed in that bitterness over growing up like I did. Right. I don't want to be there. I don't want to live in slop. Amen. And that's the nice word that starts with S. Yeah, right, right. I don't want to live in it. That's what the prodigal son said. What am I doing living in this slop? Right. Every now and then you just got to shake yourself and say, I got to make sure I'm on the right path that God has chosen for me. Right. Now, how do you do that? You get around people that are prophetic, that are revelatory, that can help you. Jews, they would get together, they called it a midrash, and they would throw things out there and just discuss and see where they go, and they would find the thread of Holy Spirit and follow it. Amen. What Peter said earlier, and, and, and David, we don't talk much. Well, some of you do. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. But we, we keep things in. All right, how you doing? Hey, great. How are you? Might have had the worst week I ever had in my life. We just don't want to open up. Now, women, you know, my wife... You don't want to ask her sometimes how she's doing. She'll tell you about her dad, this, the corona, this. You know what? That's just how we are. Yeah. But when, when you feel that deepness in you, that's where God's trying to tap into. Yes. He just doesn't want you to have a surface relationship with him. Amen. That's right. And I got to tell you, I went years with a surface relationship. I worked in a soup kitchen for 16 years, fed the poor. We visited old people in nursing homes for years, singing songs to them and bringing them treats. We fixed up old people's houses for free. Amen. Did all kind of stuff like that. <clears throat> Started a food pantry. Don't deliver. I delivered personally 60, 70,000 pounds of food a year to people that didn't have vehicles that couldn't go to the food pantry. To get those. I didn't just talk about things. I did them. Amen. I don't tell people I do them. It's all that ancient history. I'm for, I've been a Christian 48 years. That's yeah. stuff I did in the first 25, 30 years. Yeah. And then God moves you on. See, here, here's a word. If some of you need to remember one word, don't despise small things. Amen. Right. That's right. Small things can bloom into big things. Right. God does not really get a whole lot of glory when he takes a big thing and makes it just a little bit bigger. He gets glory when he takes a nothing. And makes it into an Abadanza. Yes. I want to be an Abadanza Amen. Christian. That's right. I want, I want, I, look, I want everything. See, the reason that I believe this father issue is so huge in our country, Ruth Bernicke just sent me an article. Fatherlessness, uh, the American children right now, according to the statistics, it was a study done. 18% are growing up in the home with the original mother and father. 18%. That's more than 8 out of 10. Now that is they divorced, they were illegitimate, they all were different reasons. I mean, maybe they got remarried, they had a different step stepfather. 8 out of 10 kids are living in a dysfunctional relationship with, with father images. My God. See, that's a, that's a good scheme of the enemy. We see it played out now in our schools. They're trying to teach things that bring people away from the gospel. From right. the kingdom. Right. That's right. It's, it's a, a very clear pattern of the enemy. And so my deal the past 20 years has been fatherlessness. Mm -hmm. I'm still on it. And when Chuck prophesied to me and said, you're going to express a new, re a, a new expression of the father's love. Well, you know, I this is the way I took it. And we take things sometimes and we don't see the whole picture. How many of you have gone years and went, oh, that's what that meant? Because you, you understood something you didn't realize oh, yeah. before. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, became, yeah, I feel well, I'm going to be a good father to my kids. I was. I'm going to be a good husband. I'm going to be a good. Now I'm a good grandfather. I got to, I got to watch myself because I come into the room and you know, if they're having a family gathering, the in-laws are there and the, all the kids are there, and I walk in. Hey, who's your favorite? And they go, Papa. <laughs> the in-laws were there. <laughs> I love being Papa. I love being Dad. But that word was more than just for my personal family. Right. It was for the body of Christ. Amen. It was for the kingdom of God. Yeah. And so, a couple, three, four years ago, we were at your church, King of Kings, and Chuck said, John, you're going to go to the 13 colonies and, and uncover unrighteous roots. What does that mean? <laughs> I looked at Trump and I went, what? 
Because Chuck will prophesy things which take, I put 50,000 miles on my car just driving in the 13 colonies going like this from Georgia up to Maine. Back and forth meeting with people. And we got this revelation about how the bastard curse was sown into America when we broke from Britain and the, the violence and the bloodshed that came from them. They were supposed to be our father, not our king. And they treated us as a money source. We disrespected them. It was a two-way street. Right. Went to England and, and met at a big prophetic conference. And England repented to America for how they treated us during the revolution. It was amazing. And then we repented for not honoring them as a father so that it may be well for us all of our life. Wow. And I thought, well, that was good. That's what it's about. How many of you really feel like sometimes you did something and you realize, uh-oh, son, there's a lot more to go here. <laughs> if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. You clean up the yard. Well, there's another spot over here. Yes, sir. So we, we, we started traveling the 13 colonies, preaching. The, 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 the testimonies are unbelievable. If you go on uh, YouTube, Align for His Glory, uh, the Type in a line for his glory, bastard curse, and you'll be able to see the teaching. We get emails from people all over the world. Just got one the other day from Russia. I just went through that video, and it has deeply impacted my life. See, I say impact. Say say the word impact. impact. Now, if you ever played football, you like your coach saying, you just made an impact on that guy. I mean... I want to make an impact with my life. I don't just want to live my life and die. Right. Amen. That's right. That's the destiny that God has for you is not to do that. The enemy's plan is for you just to live and die. Never make, never change anything. So now I've got this message about how fatherlessness is killing America. Yes. Candace Owens. Number one issue that she has is fatherlessness. Yes. I'm thinking... Maybe I can get this. Now, here's how your mind works. Because I've heard nobody preach what I just shared with you about that. And go on and look at the bastard curse. I, I, don't, I don't hear people preaching. I hear them preach about the father's love and fatherlessness, but not how that curse is working in our country. Right. I mean, it, it's a curse. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I'll get, I'll get, send her a copy and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll contact this one. I'm not going to name names, but they're big shots in the body of Christ. They have, Publishings, they have TV shows. I didn't get one response. Not one. Because, see, it wasn't their assignment. Right, that's right. Nothing against them. It's my assignment. Right, that's right. See, I can't say, oh, I'll get somebody else that's famous to do it. Maybe it'll be important. Because my mind, this is, now I'm, t- I'm talking to you, I'm being very real. I'm telling you how your mind can talk you out of your assignment. Wow, that's good. Wow. Preach it, brother. I'm just telling you. So now I go, my son, uh, my grandson, Brooks, loves baseball. He's in a clinic now with former Mets players and California Angels, and he's 10 years old. And I, you know, I, mean, I have no aspirations. He may be a pro ball player. Who knows? I don't know. But that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to spend time with my grandson, and that's what he likes to do. Right. So we're going, and he's on a rec team. Now, the rec Players, a lot of them are not serious about their sport. You know, some of you had kids, you know, Rick, they just go out to play. That's not what Brooks is into. He's into <laughs> baseball. You know, he's into playing baseball, winning baseball. So there was a kid on uh, his team. Uh, he was a black boy named Has- Hassan. And I was sitting next to a lady on the, and I kept looking at her because she reminded me of my mother. And it was Hassan's grandmother. She's white, he's black. And so I, at, through the season, I got to talking to her, and Hassan was had a little hitch, and I used to be a hitting coach, so I spent about 15 minutes with him and showed him how to level out a little bit in the next game, man. He almost hit a home run. And she, so she, every time I woke up, there's the guy that taught my grandson how to hit. And she said, I paid a guy $300 for hitting lessons, and he did more for him in 15 minutes. And she said, can I pay you? I said, absolutely. <laughs> Who's your favorite? Yeah. <laughs> so... But the spirit of God fell on me in the bleachers as I'm watching this kid. And I said, I said, it's not really his grandmother. It's a woman that's taking care of him. I said, what's Hassan's story? What, where's, where's his mom and dad? She said, well, his mother's in jail for substance. And the father, the guy that he thought was his father for five years, had two older brothers and a younger sister. They did a DNA test and found out he wasn't the father. 
and he just up and went to Florida. Wow. Took his brothers and his little sister with him, and so left this kid in Atlantic City on the street. Mm. Wow. And so this lady, her son was dating Hassan's mother before she got locked up, and then she heard about it, so she took him in. For five, she's had him for six years. <clears throat> And so I, I said, you know, her name's Elizabeth. I said, Mrs. Elizabeth Green. I said, Mrs. Green, I take uh, Brooks after the season. He's been going to a clinic. I, I feel like maybe Hassan would like that. Would you mind if I took him and I, I, I'll pay for it? She said, oh, no, no. I said, no, no, I, I, I'll pay. She said, well, then I'll pay for half. Have to let me know how much it is. I said, let me, let me just take him. So he's been going with us since the end of August, September, October, November, December. They don't know I'm a Christian. They don't know I'm a pre preacher because the Lord told me, I want you to do. I don't Amen. want you to say. <laughs> what are you doing? Guys, what are you doing with your life? You know, I'm thinking about this bastard curse. It is a, revel a revelatory message that could blow up. But now I'm with an 11 year old little black kid who's been totally abandoned totally rejected and I'm looking at him he's riding in my truck and I begin to feel what he's feeling mm -hmm. I remember I heard a minister talk one time he ministers uh, mainly to homosexuals and he woke up in the middle of one night and he felt homosexual tendencies he felt the draw he felt the lust he felt the desire and he's like God what are you doing to me and he said I'm just letting you feel what they're feeling and I could feel the rejection in this. He didn't talk the whole first month that he, we drove to the clinics twice a week. But if, you know, I always brought Brooks a snack and a Gatorade, why bring Hassan a snack and a Gatorade? Just, and I want to really be professional and not tear up when I think about this, but it's so deep. Yeah. It's yeah. deep. Right. His, his, his caretaker grandmother came out to the truck when I dropped him off and she came, I was sitting with my arm on the sill of the truck and she came and she put two hands on my forearm and she said, I want you to know something. Unsaved woman, God has sent you to me to help me. Hey, wow. <laughs> hallelujah. Wow. Right, right. <laughs> When's the last time an unsaved person came to you and verified what God was telling you to do. Amen. <laughs> she said, I want you to know what Hassan said about you. I said, what? She said, I said, Hassan, how do you like going to the clinic with, with Brooks's papa? He said, Grammy, he treats me like his grandson. Hey! Wow. wow. And he's my papa. Wow. Wow. Right. That's the greatest compliment I've ever received. Amen. In the Bible's case. And you might think, well, you know, and you, you, you hear all these. One time I was with Peter Wagner at a, a table. It was at the ICA luncheon. Peter said, come with me. Chuck had to go somewhere. So, I mean, I'm not going to name the people around the table, but you would probably recognize half of them. Most of them are TV shows and huge ministries all around the world. And he said, and I was sitting to Peter's right, and he said, let's go around the table and everybody give a, you know, a two-minute blurb on your ministry, which is dangerous to do with a bunch of preachers. But it, it, it anyway. <laughs> and I mean, this one guy, you know, we just had 40,000 people down in South America. We just had 50,000 people over here in the Africa. We just had 4,000 leaders in Russia. We just had this and that. And they come around to me. <laughs> and my son had just gone uh, down a dirt bike trail out in the middle of the Pine Barrens and somebody strung a cable across the road oh. and at the last minute he saw it pulled his handle, handlebars up it ticked off the handlebars hit the top of his helmet and flipped him off the bike and hurt him but he lived Amen. when I was 16 I was riding with a guy on mini bikes through the woods one of my best friends, Danny, and hit him in the neck, and he died 10 seconds later. Oh, wow. So it's like a flashback to me. And as I'm sitting at this table with all these thousands of testimonies of this and this and that happened, I said my son was riding his motorcycle through the woods, and somebody strung a cable, and it almost hit him and killed him. 
but he lived. I'm thankful that my son's alive. Amen. Yeah, man. Yeah. And then one, really, one by one, just about everybody at the table went, my wife's divorcing me. Jesus. I'm being investigated for this. I mean, then they started getting real. Real. Oh, yeah. See, even big shot men like to put on a good front. Right. And pretty soon, people were crying. They were laying hands on each other. They were ministering to people. Mm. Peter Wagner looked at me and goes, what did you start? Because <laughs> he had an agenda he wanted to do. I mean, Peter was just an amazing person. And uh, I said, well, I didn't know what to say because I don't have thousands of people coming to hear me say anything. He said, no, that broke it open. Remember, Sometimes you guys are like eggs. Mm. Got that shell. But there's more in here than there's on the outside. Right. You got to break it open. Yes. And I got nine chickens, so I found it advantageous at my age to learn how to take care of old hens. <laughs> Remember, it stays in here. It stays. Cheryl will be here. Yeah, when you see Cheryl, don't walk through. Hi, Cheryl. Don't do that. Oh, 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 oh. In Job chapter 8, verse 7, it says, Though thy beginnings were small, yet thy latter should greatly increase. God gets glory in taking small and multiplying it. Amen. You know, and we sometimes can discount insignificant things. And I just want to remind you just a couple of things. David, when they came back at Ziglag, their families were taken. All their stuff was taken. And what was the key to the recovery? A starving Egyptian. Now, I just want you to picture yourself as one of David's leaders, military leaders, one of his mighty men. He stays in that tent there so long, they start murmuring. And now he brings in a starving Egyptian for counsel to get information from. And can you, can you hear him talking? What's he in there with an Egyptian? This is Egypt, where they came from for foreign. I mean, this is not a popular, this would be like talking to... I told Khomeini's cousin for advice on what to do in the economy in America. You know? <laughs> Why are they talking? Why is he talking that to the point where they talked about killing David? Right. But that was the key to them recovering all. That little insignificant starving Egyptian was the key that God put in their midst to recover all. I believe this little kid, Hassan, is key to breaking this bastard curse in America. You might say, well, how's that going to work? I don't have a clue. <laughs> but I, I, I want that kid to know he's got backup. That's yes. right. There's nothing worse than being a kid with no backup. That's right. That's right. And I know what he's feeling. I can feel it when I'm around him. And I, I, I said, my grandson, Brooks, who I, I have conversations with about, my kids hear the word, I love you. They feel my lips on their forehead. Amen. They know that they have a pup up that loves them. That's right. My grandparents in the fifties, men didn't talk like that. They did. Yeah. Amen. How you doing, pup up? You know, I mean, it was, <laughs> my one uh, grandfather was a staunch Republican. My other grandfather was a staunch Democrat. It wasn't pretty. One would call me a Democrat, and the other one called me a Republican. <laughs> you know, when I, whenever th something happened, I wondered, oh yeah, he's GD Democrat. You can tell by the way he yeah. acts. You know, what I mean. That's just the way it was. Was it a compliment? No. <laughs> I want these kids to grow. So I said to Brooks, I said, what do you think about Hassan? Hassan didn't come one week because he had a cold. He said, well, he said, that was a 10-year-old. It's made me realize what wonderful parents I have. Amen. Amen. How they, they, they get me everything. They do everything for me. And he doesn't have that. And I feel sad for him sometimes. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to drive my truck on this, right? That's what I want you to see, kid. Keep bringing it up. I said, will you make sure you have compassion with him when you understand you don't know what he's lived through? Right, right. You don't know the road. Well, look, we've all been on. How many of you have stories? Yes. Yeah. We all got the story. Yes, that's right. But I'm so thankful that this little 10-year-old is seeing this play out firsthand. Now, what does that do on the national picture? I don't know. But I know... <clears throat> that we have the ability in Christ to break every curse that's in our land. Amen. Amen. And fatherlessness, Candace Owen, is right on. 
she was on a committee and they were talking about white supremacy. And she said, that's not the big issue in the, in the black community right now. The big issue in the black community is fatherlessness. Right, that's right. We don't have the KKK marching down the streets in LA. He said, we, we got a lot of kids running around without fathers. Right. Well, what do we do about it? That's it. Good question. We seek the path that we're supposed to be on to undo that curse. Amen. Amen. You know, when you talk about curses and the devil in church, you get a little nervous. Oh, I just want to praise the Lord. I just want to worship. You got to read your Bible a little yes. bit. Amen. Right. 20% of the New yeah. Testament is Jesus dealing with demons. That's right. Casting them out. That's right. The Bible says in Acts about Stephen that he was a man filled with faith and power. What was he filled with? Faith and power. Amen. Now look, I've been around, I've been at this a long time, 48 years. In one form of ministry, another almost instantly went into some type of service ministry. I've been around a lot of people that have faith. Mm -hmm. You're all here. You're men of faith. I don't know that we have to do an altar call here, but if you're not saved, get saved. That's right. It's a good deal. Good deal. <laughs> it's the best deal you'll ever get in your life. Amen. Yes. But how do we move from a generation that doesn't even know what it feels like? That's what blessed me when this little kid said, he treats me like I'm his grandson. Wow. For the first time in his life, yes. yeah, he felt that. Yes. You can do the same thing wherever you're looking. God has a mission field for you wherever you're planning. If it's on the job, if it's on the street, if it's where you shop, if it's where you recreation, there's a mission field there. There's some find your assignment. Amen. Don't go through life just coming to church and tithing. Amen. Amen. Nothing wrong with coming to church. Nothing wrong with tithing. But you need to be with a troop, a tribe, however you want to call it, of people that can help you find your path Amen. and equip you to be successful at it. Amen. Right. I mean, you, when you start talking about missions and, and w w what's your assignment? What's the Lord said to you today? I never forget an old lady came up to me one time. This was in the late 80s. And she said, what's father saying to you, son? And I was like, eh. <laughs> He loves me. You know, I mean, well, well, I had nothing. You know what I mean? But she said, oh, Father, Father wants to communicate openly with you. Yeah. Really? I, nobody had ever really told me that. I always thought the big name got the, the word or the picture. God, this is a revelatory season that's opening up and breaking through to some of you that have never heard the voice of the Father. Never had a revelatory vision. But it's to help you. It's not that you become a big deal and get a spot on the Elijah list or CNN, CBN, whatever. It is. It's that you get on your path. Yes, sir. You fulfill what God has for you to fulfill while you're here on this earth, and you don't leave it undone. Now, I don't know. Uh, some of you look as nervous as a cat with a long tail in a room full of rocking chairs right now. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you want an assignment? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. How many of you want to make sure you're on the right path? Amen. Because the deceivers out there to deceive. Right. Look, the people who feel that the Holy Spirit is nothing, it was just the smoke that went through in Egypt when there's hey, half the church is there. Wow. Tongues are of the I've heard. People in church say tongues are of the devil. Yeah. I'm just telling you. Wow. We have somebody come to our house for prayer. The, the ministry times have been lessened because of COVID. Uh -huh. But we prayed in English. Uh -huh. My friend Richard Martin, he's a retired Marine and, and state trooper. Uh -huh. he, he's my prayer partner for doing deliverances on people. Uh -huh. He, I said, Rich, you pray for this guy. And he prayed in English. He found some things. Tremendous anointing. And I said, you know what? Do you pray in tongues? The person we were ministering to said, yes. I said, we're going to pray in tongues for five minutes. We started praying in tongues. About three minutes into it, it was like I was in, I don't even know where I was. It was like a wave caught me and took me. Mm -hmm. And all of the, the other, Richard and this other person felt it too. And we were praying in tongues as loud as we could pray. Let me tell you, tongues is part of your equipment. Yes. 
That's right. You cannot discount what God has said. What did, what did Jesus say? Don't say something's unholy when I say it's holy. Right. He must go. I must go so he can come. Yes. That's what Jesus said. Yes. Why did he have to go so he can? Because he could lead us and guide us into all truth. Amen. Right. That's right. Yeah. We can be led and guided into partial truth. Right. We can be led and guided to be doing things that are good things. But they're not necessarily God things. Amen. That's right. It works. At age sixty-seven, I don't want to do good things anymore. Amen. I want to right. do God um, things. Yes, yeah, sir. Right. And one of your questions should, should be when you pray: Am I doing good things or God things? Uh, Father, help me. Yeah. Be a good son. Yeah. I don't pray to be an apostle. I don't pray to be a pastor or preacher. I, I prayed that I'd have a message here, and I thought, well, let me. I, I normally would do a PowerPoint. I, I, I'm not even looking at my notes. I'm just talking to you from here. I hope you can appreciate Thank that. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I know the speakers that you have here. They're very world class speakers. But see, I lived what I'm talking to you. Amen. I'm walking it out as I'm talking it to you. Right. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Let me tell you, it's going quick, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> going quick. I just got Aaron Rivera. She sent me a picture. Her second son just got his driver's license. Aaron and her husband, and she had a baby, was at our church 20 years ago. We did the baptism for that baby. Wow. And he's the second licensed driver. That's, that's how quick it is. Yeah. They go from babies to behind a steer wheel and you go, wow, where did that time go? Yes. And am I the only one that's had that experience no, in my no, life or what? Life is going quick. quick. Yes, sir. Only one life will soon be passed if only what's done for Christ will last. Yes, yes. Find out what he wants you to do with your life. Right. He doesn't, he, look, guys, he just doesn't want you to come and pick out a breakfast. That's right. That's right. That's right. Here's some guy from South Jersey. And, just so I'm not self-conscious, I'm having a toothpick implant. We do have dentists in South Jersey. I know you think we're not saying that. The toothbrush was invented down there, right? Yeah, we, we invented the toothbrush because all the pineys you know, were tired of trying to eat corn on the cob with three teeth. <laughs> they only have one tooth. Yeah. That was a toothbrush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the lady who took care of my dad in the 90s, she had one tooth right here. And then I said to my father, look, let's take her and get her straight away, get teeth made. Well, when he went into her mouth, she had six teeth broken off at the gum with the nerve exposed. Oh. So we had them all taken care of, had her false teeth, but she never wore them. She wouldn't wear the false teeth. So she's walking around with no teeth now. She'd love it because she didn't have pain right, right. In, her, in her jaw. Help me get back on track. Well, yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's all right. You know, you think about your bloodline, you think, what... Most of the time when you say, tell me about your family, uh -huh. it's not good stories you tell. Most of the time, the things you remember are the negatives. Wow. Three years ago, somebody sent me an article right when we started looking into this curse about my uh, great uncle and my, and my grandfather had two brothers. That he was the youngest, two older brothers. How they built 600 landing craft for World War II in Parkertown, New Jersey. They had half the town employed. They cut the lumber. They they built the boats. They put Model T Ford engines in them, and they built 600 landing craft. 200 of them were used overseas in the, in the beach invasions. Mm. And I began to say, "Wow, I didn't." Now this is two, three years ago. I'm, I'm 65 years old, 64 years old. I'm finding out that my family built landing craft, mm. which I kind of thought was a poor design. The way the boat fell down, they were all, you know, I just thought. <laughs> They just aimed at the door and waited for it to drop, you know. But yet they were part of a movement right. that freed countries. Right, right, right. See, that's what I'm, Lord, in my blood, Amen. there's a movement to free countries. Yes. Now, on the other side, my mother, we lived in a trail, 40 foot, 12 foot wide by 40 foot wide trailer. Uh, we were really looked down upon by just about, you know, most people in town. A lot of people down there let their kids play with me, probably for good reason. But, uh, you know, my mother started a daycare center. 
started a Head Start program. That my wrestling coach was the principal. And then there was a guy who got cut his leg real bad in the ocean. I don't know, remember how he got it cut. I don't think he got bit by anything, but he got a real bad laceration when he jumped in, jumped into a piece of metal. And by the time they got him to Tom's River, he bled to death. Wow. And my, my mother was incensed by that. Uh, he shouldn't have died. She said, we need a hospital here in Mount Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. Went to the township committee and they said, look, we don't have money for that. We don't to start this the seed process for for them to investigate and examine whether or not it was plausible was just minimum twenty thousand dollars to get the experts out to look at things, you know, the engineers and the surveyors and all that. And so they said, we we don't have the money for that. We're not, you know, we can't. So my mother took me and my sister, and every now and then we had some friends that would come with us. We'd go door to door in Beach Haven West in the summertime, all summer long, a couple times a week, shaking a can. We're collecting money to get a hospital together. Wow. Two years later, we had $20,000 in my mother's closet. Now, you got to understand, my mother made about $5,000 a year then, as a single parent secretary. And we got 20 grand sitting in the closet. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thankfully, then I started claiming when I was 11, I was making 40, 50 bucks a day. I didn't need her money. Amen. So I paid my mother rent from the time I was 11. Amen. Because she needed it. Right. So she, needed it. so she went to Trenton. She met with some politicians in Trenton. She gave them the $20,000. They started the seed money. And right now there's a hospital there called Southern Ocean County Hospital. <laughs> so in my bloodline, there's a care for the young children to be educated and cared for and a care for people to not have to die unnecessarily. Right. See, you got to, that's in your, every one of you, you have a righteous thread in your bloodline. Don't just focus on what your mother or father didn't do or what your uncle did to you. Fine, get past that and then begin to ask the Lord, what is the righteousness, the righteous threads in my bloodline? When I meet people, I try to find a righteous thread in them and what they're talking to me about. What's their passion? What do they care about? And, and, and that's what you highlight and accent and ask them questions on it, and help nudge them forward into that. You never know who you're going to run into. This Hassan might be greater than Billy Graham. I don't know. But I know God takes little things of nothing and makes them big. At the Mount of Beatitudes, hey, 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 Lord, send them away so they can get something to eat. What do you got? What's in your hand? Well, a couple of fish and a couple of bread. So just tell them to go, go to the restaurants. No, you, you feed it. You know what he's saying to some of you here today? You feed it. Amen. You do it. Do it. Now, I will eventually talk to Mrs. Green about the Lord, and I will eventually talk to Hassan, but I will have a track record of performance that wasn't preachy to him. And there's nothing wrong with being preachy. I'm just telling you, this is how the Holy Spirit told me to deal with this Amen. household. Amen. Right. Keep my mouth shut and do for them. Right. Help them. Express the Father's love to this little boy right. who doesn't know Father, doesn't know his Father. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's kind of worse when you lived with a guy for five years and then he decide, decides, you know, my mom did work, you know, I'm skipping town, leaving you homeless. Wow. Abandonment, rejection. You can feel it on this kid. Mm. My friends, there's a lot out there just like that for you. Yeah. Yeah, it only takes a kind word. Amen. For Christmas, I asked, now, wait to hear this. I called up Mrs. Green before Christmas two weeks. I said, tell me about Hassan and Christmas. What do, you, do you need anything? What's he want? Is there? Because she's on a fixed income. <coughs> she said, John, uh, you're not going to believe this, but I'm, you know, it's amazing. I said, what? Because all around where they live in these townhomes, there's churches all around. She said he made a list of what he wanted. Some of it was Hostetler. That's like some kind of clothing, PlayStation, you know, different things kids want but when they're 11. He had a list of, she said, about a dozen items. She said there's guys in the, the townhouse here who are, uh, they have a motorcycle club. They're older guys. So it's not a motorcycle gang. It's a club. Right. <laughs> and one of them knew her situation with Hassan. Yeah. And he, they said, you know, do you know? Is there anything we can do? She said, well, here's his, he said, get me his list and we'll see. They got everything 
on that verse. Hallelujah. <laughs> Drinking, cussing motorcycle guy. <laughs> Got everything on that list. The churches were nowhere to be found. My God. See, we've lost something. We've lost charity. We've lost compassion. Please find compassion. Yes. One of the most rewarding things I've ever done is dealt with this little boy. I've washed presidents' feet, baptizing them overseas. I've dealt with kings. I can't compare it to dealing with this 11-year-old little boy. It's done, it's done something. You know, and I, I was feeling all these feelings, and I thought, well, am I still being healed from all the mess? My, you know, when I blew my knee apart when I was wrestling in Iowa, I came to my dad because I needed money for tuition for the next semester. I was going to be a sophomore and he said well if i were you i would join the army and they had a thing going on then i don't know if you remember it's called vietnam <laughs> <laughs> join the army and he goes you'll probably do a nine-month tour and then your college will be free right because he didn't want to part with anything you know i might i might dad can make a buffalo cry on a nickel <laughs> And we had a wonderful reconciliation. A week before he died, we reconciled and made me the executor of the state. I mean, everything worked out, but it took almost 48 years. Okay. Uh, I just, I guess what I'm trying to say to you is it's more than just, it's good that you get together, you share phone on, you pray together, but it's also, there's an individual destiny that's tied in with your corporate destiny. We feel good when we're tied into a, 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 an organization that's doing good stuff. Don't you? We give to, you know, I give to wounded warriors. I give to the puppy thing. I, I mean, every now and then I'll send them 15 bucks here or there. Then you get requests from everybody. Okay, but Every now and then there's something required of you to give that nobody knows about. It's between you and the Lord. And you look up and you say, Father, make me a good son. Yeah. Let me be about what did Jesus say? Let me be about my father's business. Now you have your natural business. You have to tend to your wife and children and your business, your electric bill, all that. You have all that. But you do have a calling and a destiny to be about your father's business. Whatever that entails. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be on have a mic on Christian television. It may be just the kid down the street. I'm not telling you to go find a kid that doesn't have a father. I'm telling you, find your assignment. Hear the voice of God. Now, if you don't hear the voice of God, get around people that you know who hear the voice of God. That's right. Spend some time first and say, you know what? I think this is what God's leading me to do. Please help me verify that. What do you think? What's God saying to you? Wow. It's good to bounce things around to find out, to make sure you're walking the right path. Amen. Amen. Full of faith and power. I don't just want to be filled with faith. And, I, you know, it sounds so weird hearing a preacher say that. Don't I? I want to be filled with faith and power. Yeah. Well, what does that power involve? We've had six people raised from the dead. Amen. I was praying for somebody at a tent meeting in Atlanta City, and a tumor dropped right out of her uterus. Glory. Glory. <laughs> It freaked me out. I thought it was, you know, I saw that movie Alien when that thing popped out. I thought, uh oh. This, you know, <laughs> look out, George. What is it God wants you to do? Are you satisfied with what you've done so far? No. Do you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm okay, you're okay? No. Do you reach for more? You know, I told my dad, I said, Dad, the army's not going to take me with this. I had my leg in the cast. I had my first knee operation. I can't go in the army. He went, well, try. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll take me. His response to helping me pay for college tuition was maybe go get shot. And if you live, you'll get free college. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way my dad was. Okay? And a week before he died, he reconciled. Amen. So wow. 
I can tell when him and mom are together up in heaven because the lightning goes this way across the sky. <laughs> <laughs> she died 10 years after him. She was very happy she outlived him 10 years. You know? yeah. She found great joy in that. <laughs> but my mother, thank God I had my mother. Of course, this kid didn't even have a mother. She was in jail. My mother had my back. She provided for us. My mother was a member of the Mensa organization. Anybody here know what Mensa is? She took a two-day test. My her her sister, who had had means and was a smart woman too, had a bet with her that they could go take these tests and that, that she would get in and my mom wouldn't. My mom aced it. She was in the upper two tenths of the one percentile of the country, and my my aunt didn't get in. So my mother found great joy in that. <laughs> but that's how my mother was a brilliant woman. She could write two letters at the same time, mm. pen in each hand, to two different people. Mm. I, I, she blew me away. But without her, and I look at this kid, I think, he doesn't have a mother like I have. <clears throat> I don't care how bad you had it, because somebody had it worse. Yeah, that's right. Get over you. I'm t- look, I'm telling you, I had to get over me. Wasn't right. Wasn't right what the coach did. Wasn't right what this one did. I coached Little League for seven years. We came in first place five times. We came in second once and third once. And the year I came in third was one of my best years because we had all nine-year-olds playing against 12-year-olds. And see what these guys realized. We went eight and eight that year. It was the worst record I had, eight and eight. All the coaches, I was a teenager coaching the team that I played on. All the coaches were going, his whole team is back <laughs> for the next three years. <laughs> and we just, we went 15 and one. We always lost one game. We were 15 and one, 15 and one, 15 and one. But they changed the rules for the all-star coach. All the old guy, old boys, you know, they had a meeting. You have to be at least 18 years old. And then when I got to be 18, we were 15 and one. They made the rule. You had to be 21. <laughs> and I never did get to coach the all-star team. Oh, one year I put eight kids on the all-star team. Mm-hmm. Two of them were my cousins. And the coach that was coaching it didn't play him. Wow. And I went over to the dugout the last inning. And I did. I wasn't a Christian then, so you'll have to forgive me. I said, if you don't put them kids in one inning, your teeth will be in the dugout. Wow! Wow! They were losing seven to nothing. They put my cousin Adam in. I mean, he was my pitcher. He wound up being the first high school pitcher to win the championship for Southern Regional, the county championship. He he threw nine pitches that inning and struck out the (laughs) sign. (laughs) <laughs> parents, I was sitting, I got away from, I went to the other bleachers with the other parents because I wanted to get away from that coach. I, I knew I was going to hop the fence. <laughs> and they went, wow, where'd they get this kid? They should have had this kid pitching the first inning. And then my guys came up. We lost seven to six. They wow. scored six runs in the last inning. Wow. We, we'd have beat that team 20 to nothing if my kids played. Mm-hmm. See that? God always was was trying to get me past a place of bitterness, right. even when I wasn't saved. Some of those experiences, you don't understand why you went through them, but see, it's so you can experience them and not do them to other people. Right, that's right. That's right. That's Shake right. it off. Shake it yes, off. And say, where's, where's the victim now that I can get out of that pit that the enemy tried to throw me in? Mm-hmm. Read about all the prophets in the Old Testament. They didn't have... Wonderful lives. They went into some dark, damp, dreary places. But it was so God could perform a work through them to affect their time frame on earth. I want to affect the time frame I'm here on earth. Mm. Yes. I do. I mean, you know, look at the political structure we got going on. I mean, it's just a wild. But, you know, Jesus dealt with that. Judas wanted Jesus to... Fulfill his political agenda. That's what brought him down. Be careful, folks, of getting too political. Yeah. Know what God is doing and, and vote for that because you'll get what you vote for. Right, that's right. You'll get it. We're getting it now. Yes, sir. I had my tenants, you know, was a staunch uh, Biden supporter and, and you know, I, I supported Trump and we're, we're friendly. She's a great tenant. And I, I went over, I was talking to her the other day. She paid rent. She said, Yeah, I really watch where I go now because. Gas prices. Right. And I just, I smiled. <laughs> you know, I'm, 
Well, you voted for it. I mean, <laughs> we were energy independent. Now we're not. We're, we're asking Russia and OPEC to make more oil for us. It ain't working. We can't get so political that we can't. Now, I can say, oh, well, you deserve that. I said, but isn't it wonderful the Lord still loves us? Right. you got to get away from that. Polit it's a bitter political arena that we're in right now. Right. Yes, it is. It's an anti-God structure. Yes, right. that's right. I mean, a lot of these stuff that's going on, it's, you can see Antichrist in the structure. Yeah. And I want to rise above it. Right. Yes, sir. If you get a chance to go on Glory Zion, look at uh, Isaac Petrie and Ken Mattis. They mm -hmm. talked about being seated. In heavenly places. There is a whole new realm for us to be in that we've not entered in yet. Yeah. Kent and Kent was talking about an experience he had with a couple of his guys in his church. They actually went up and sat in the heavenly realm. And they described to each other when they when it was over what they saw, what they were there, and they all had similar experiences. Boy, that'll change you. Amen. That'll change your perspective. Amen. Yes, sir. I'm hungry for that kind of stuff. Amen. Yes. I don't just want to do church. And I love church. I want to do God. Amen. Amen. I want to feel him. Hallelujah. Yes. yes, Lord. My wife is, some of you don't never met her, don't know her. She lives in a different realm sometimes. <laughs> Amen. Hopefully she's not in the credit card at the store round. <laughs> But she, she sees things right. And things happen She took a picture of the trees The snow was in the top of the trees And the sunset was setting And the whole trees I have it on my phone The whole tree looked like it was on fire mm. wow. Bright orange The reflection of the snow in the tree, on the tree right next to our house wow. And she said And God spoke to me and said There's a new glory being released wow. And, and, and in Leviticus 26.10, it talks about going into your storehouse and emptying the old stuff that's in it. Because he's getting ready to pour in new stuff to you. Leviticus 26.10, read Amen. it. You go Amen. And all that he's going to do for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have stuff in storage that you've never used. Right, right. right. Get rid of it. Amen. You don't want to get rid of it. How many of you look in your closet and go, man, I don't have an empty hanger, but I don't wear half this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Get rid of it. I just went through my closet and threw out some stuff. Took it to the Goodwill bin. If you're not using it, get rid of it. Right. Right. That's right. Get Amen. something new that you will use. <laughs> it's no good having 300 tools if you never pick one up. Yeah. Right. Get a hatchet. Go chop something down. I mean, do something right. for the kingdom of God. Whatever it is, it could be something small. But don't despise the small beginnings. That's right. I want to encourage you to do something small. Amen. It may be given buying somebody a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. When I stop going to therapy, I stop at Applebee. Sometimes I got to know the waitress. They start telling me of all their, I'm battling depression. You know, it's amazing. You're just sitting there having a cup of soup and they start pouring out to you. Wow. Right. Jesus. You know, and I got them Christmas cards with a little gift card in it. Said, I'm praying for you. Amen. These kids, they start crying. Mm -hmm. Right. They want to know people care. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah. there's people around you that want to know you care. Amen. Right. Amen. Yes, sir. But we got this. Hey, how you doing? Hey, the yard looks nice. Yeah. It's true. Small talk. Yeah. I'm getting to the place. I'm 67. I want people to know that I love them. Amen. I went down to Texas. I took Chad and his wife. I. He, Friend, we traveled all over the world. Him and I actually did wash the president's feet together in Nigeria. Pray for the guy. Wow. And he's a black man. He's married to a white girl. We had you know, it's just an amazing journey that I've been on with this guy. So I said, you know what? I've never really sat down with you. I'm taking you out to dinner, took him out to a real nice steakhouse. And I said, I want you to know you're like, I'm not your father. Chuck's your father. I'm I'm your older brother. You're like a kid brother to me. I love you. Wow. And I said, and you're part of him. I don't know you like I know him, but I want to get to know you so I can love you just as much as I love him. Wow. I didn't talk like that 10 years ago. <laughs> Start talking like that. Amen. These people are tears coming down their cheek. You know what? We bonded. Right. Don't be loose. Yeah. Loosey goosey with your relationships. Mm -hmm. Tell them how you feel. Tell your wife how much you appreciate. Tell, tell your kids. Yeah.
Do something unexpected for somebody. It doesn't have to be a relative. Right. See what God can do through you. I love hearing what God does through Peter and Trisha and Dave and all you guys. I love hearing the stories. But it's nothing like having your own story. Right. Yeah. right. That's right. Lord, what would you have me to do today? Start your day off talking to Father. Normally, I pray in tongues for a couple minutes when I wake up. I don't want to start my day in English. Mm. Holy Spirit, help me. Set my feet right on the beginning of this day. That's right. It's a dawning of a new day. I want to make sure I'm dawning in the right direction. Amen. Yes. Oh, course. I pray in tongues for a couple minutes. My friend Richard Martin, he sets his watch. He prays at least an hour a day in tongues. Wow. He's been getting up at two in the morning, bars, and praying till five, three hours now. He's up to three. I'm just trying to keep up with him. I'm just trying to keep up. Because the Bible says it renews you. Amen. It strengthens you. One time my wife was having female operation in Camden, and the orderly was nasty. He came in and he said, uh, my daughter's a nurse, and she was going to spend the night with her, and she had a little wooden chair. And she said, do you have a, a you know, padded chair for my daughter? He said, no, we don't have any of that stuff. And he said, I'm just going to leave the blood pressure band on your arm so I don't have to put it on you in the middle of the night. Can you imagine having that blood pressure band on all night? Oh, my, my, my wife is, you know, my, my wife and Trisha, are, I think, are secret daughters or something. <laughs> She's like, I'm not putting up with this. And so when she left the room, Julie Cheryl started praying, binding the devil. She said, send him to another floor. I don't want to deal with that guy. Lord, i got enough to deal with now. Send him to another floor. And as she prayed, she saw a little muscle man come up out of her chest and stomach area. And he stood up and he hit. she said he was stacked. He had muscles. I said, it kind of looked like me, right? She went, no, he was stacked. <laughs> and it was her spirit man. Right. Amen. And five minutes later, the guy walked in. He goes, well, ladies, uh, uh, I've been transferred to another floor. You're going to have another orderly come in here. And it, it, this, this lady came in and brought a recliner for my daughter to sleep in. And my daughter was, when my wife was praying, my daughter was like, oh, mom, you know, they, they have a lot on them, you know. And then when he got transferred to another floor, she, she went, wow, mom. You know? <laughs> See, there's a, my wife is a woman of faith and power. Faith and power. If you get a message today, it's faith and power and get on the right track. Amen. Yes. What do you want to hear when you stand before the Lord? Well done. Well, you went to a lot of conferences. You went to a lot of seminars. You were tied every week. You were good. Come on in. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear well done, son. Yeah. I don't want to hear well done apostle, well done pastor, well done preacher, teacher. I want to hear well done son. Amen. Yes. Amen. I want to see the day when it's 80% of the kids in America at least have mother and father. In Amen. Yeah. Not 80% don't have mother and father. In right. You say, well, who are you, John? I'm a child of the king. Amen. Nothing's too hard for him. I can't explain to you how it's going to happen. I just know I'm on that path. Yep. That's good. I can't razzle dazzle you with numbers and statistics. All I can tell you is we get testimonies every week Amen. from around the world that watch that YouTube message about the bastard curse. Wow. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's very simple. What's the time frame here, Pete? We've got to make sure we get to the Giants game. Oh, Lord. Yeah. 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 If you're not hearing, if you're having trouble, get prayer. They have prayer teams in this church that can help you hear. Amen. For yourself, what God is saying. Yes. I was up on a ladder painting. I had just gotten saved, and I was a wild 19-year-old. And I was up there painting my grandmother's garage, and I said, Lord, what should I do about Cheryl? We were dating. Uh -huh. And he said very clearly, first time in my life, audible voice, run for your life, son. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Remember, stays here, stays here. He said, marry her. Two words. First time I heard the audible voice of the Lord. Got down off the ladder, put it away. It was like lunchtime. It was right about 11 o'clock. And so I went in the house. Of course, we didn't have cell phones then. That was in the 70s. You had to go into the dialogue. Remember that one? When I, I cleaned out that house when my father died, my brother, my nephew with me, then they had the flip phones, you know? So he said, I got to call my mom. He said, yeah, the phone's in the side right there. So he, he goes in and he's looking at it like this, like, yeah, what is that? Never saw a rotary dial phone. <laughs> My grandmother came out and said, where are you going? You're not done. I said, well, I, the Lord just spoke to me and told me to marry Cheryl. I'm going to ask her to marry me. And I had a job. I, I was supposed to go to college that year. I couldn't go. I didn't have any money. I had nothing. She went, that's, that's the gd thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, my grandmother wasn't there yet. I bought a hoagie on the way to pick up Cheryl and uh, gave her half a hoagie. And I waited until she took a big bite. <laughs> So she's over there. So yeah, I asked the Lord, what, I, what about you and me? And he told me that I was to marry you. Would you marry me? She's like, <laughs> so I waited. I knew she had to chew on it a little bit. You know? <laughs> and we just celebrated 48 years. Hey. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. Lord, I pray for every man in this room right now that you would yes, guide them yes, into all truth. Yes, he would not speak of his own initiatives. But whatever he hears, yes. get this, whatever Holy Spirit hears, then he gives it to you. Amen. Who's he hearing it from? Father. Father. He will speak and he will disclose to you Yes. What's to come? Amen. He will disclose to you what's to come. Amen. Yes. You have a right to hear Amen. what Father's saying. Yes. Part of this curse is, see, I knew everything my father had wasn't mine. Mm -hmm. I wasn't entitled to anything. Ahead. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay? Mm -hmm. Dad stuff is dad stuff. He lived with the mom. He never had a mortgage payment. He never had an electric bill. His whole life, he lived with his mom and dad. And he had money piled up. It wasn't a dime of it for me. Wow. And that mindset sinks into your psyche. So when you become a Christian, I really didn't want to. I didn't want to say the word father. So for two years as a Christian, I didn't say the word father, even when I read the Bible. I just brushed over it. But what it does, it gives you a mindset that everything that Father has that's laid up for us in heaven, waiting for us to ascend and get it, doesn't belong to us. We don't have access to it. He doesn't want us to have it. It's probably for somebody else that's better than us. I've got too much damage. I'm, I'm not real. I'm, you know, I, I don't know how to relate to a Father, anything. He'll be a, the book of the word says he'll be a father to the fatherless. Yes. That's us. That's that's half the room here. I'm gonna just guess. If I get in a room that half the people don't have father problems, that's a miracle. He's a father to the fatherless. Yes. And everything father has is yours. Amen. Amen. It's all yours. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and it's mine for the asking. Amen. Lord, give it to me. Amen. Now that doesn't mean you're gonna have not not you. You're going to have an easy life that you won't go through things. You right. will. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you will. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't come from the camp that says, you know, just name it and claim it and grab it and blab it. And, you know, everything's going to be roses. Mm -hmm. Some stuff is tough. Yeah. Yes. But he gets us to the other side. Amen. He doesn't leave us there. Right. right. 